Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here on this Tuesday. I had to look. Yes, the days are running together in this mad dash to finish up Christmas shopping and everything else going on. Music fact of the day. The song Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. That actually was inspired by the cartoon Beanie and Cecil, which lead singer Angus Young watched when he was a kid. One of the cartoon's characters was named Dishonest John and carried around a business card that said Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. It's been a while since I've done an episode. It's been about a week almost, but I've been busy just getting some things done for me personally. And also, I got some of the jail calls between Charlie and Donna. I got 68, 69 of the jail calls that took place from the day Charlie Adelson was found guilty. As far as I can see, these calls go to about the ninth, so just a few days, but there are a ton of calls. In Charlie's trial, when they say that he repeats himself a lot, Trust me, he does. They're on my YouTube if you want to go listen. I'm not going to play these on the podcast as a whole. It's harder to hear. The ones on YouTube have subtitles to kind of help guide you through them. But I do have a clip for today that I'm going to play. And then maybe at the end of the week, I'm going to do an episode to sort of just bring in some of the nuggets that are in these calls instead of just going through each call. It's a lot. A lot of it's repetitive, and there's not a lot that I really want to focus on in the calls. I think one episode breaking down in these calls is going to do it. But today, we are going to talk about the call that got Donna arrested. A couple of little things here. A search warrant was filed on the 15th for items seized on November 14th. That would have been the day after Donna was arrested at the Miami International Air airport on her way to Vietnam, stopped in the nick of time in custody since. But what were those search warrants for? Harvey's phone and his iPad. It's going to be interesting. There are a couple of these calls where Donna forgets to hit end, and we essentially get to be a fly on the wall. One other thing that surprised me in these calls is the fact that Donna and Charlie both bash Wendy. They blame her a lot in these calls for the book she wrote, which essentially kind of insults Tallahassee. Charlie also insults Tallahassee, as does Donna. And then her showing up to the crime scene an hour after it had happened, buying bullet bourbon of all things on this day, and so on. I really thought it would have been the opposite, that Donna and Wendy were closer, but it seems like Wendy has largely removed herself from this, and we'll get into all that in a minute. The one thing I was thinking about, too, is you think about it. These boys now are 13 and 14. Donna talks about this in the call we're going to go over today, but you know they're teenagers. As these boys now are at an age where they don't need constant supervision, these guys are paying the piper for Dan Markell being shot and killed. Just, um, you know, was it worth it? One other thing that stood out to me about the calls, none from Wendy. The other thing is the calls are multiple times a day for hours a day. Who does he call the most? Donna. Harvey is on some of the calls, but it's largely Charlie and Donna with Charlie just nonstop repeating how he couldn't get a fair trial in Tallahassee. Prosecutor Kappelman made this into a Dateline special Uh, We need to start a drinking game. We would all have alcohol poisoning if we did. That's how much he repeats things. But there's a weird codependency with these two. And now that Donna's been arrested, these two can't talk because they're co-conspirators. I'm very curious how they're both handling not being able to speak with each other as much as they talked before Donna was arrested. Charlie is officially in the Florida Department of Corrections. If you're on YouTube, you can see a picture of his mugshot. I call that the Alec Murdoch special, that close, close shave. People say, why do they shave their heads? I've heard a couple of reasons. Number one is so that they don't bring lice into the prison system. And also, just to knock them down a notch and to put everybody kind of on an even playing field. I'm sure if Donna saw a picture of Charlie with his hair buzz, she might clutch her pearls and cry because her baby boy's early locks are no more. He was moved to the Northwest Florida Reception Center last week. Now, what's up with this place? There are up to 1,415 inmates, and the place has been reported as one of the state's most notoriously violent prisons. He may not stay here. This is just a, kind of a stop. The other thing that I was thinking about is in prison, Charlie's going to have a target on his back, not just because this is such a high-profile case, but you have to remember, Charlie got up on that stand and pointed the finger at the lack. Kings. 
talked about the Latin Kings. That's been a central part of this case since Luis Rivera was arrested. Good luck, Charlie. And it's not like people in prison don't know about cases. My contact in prison, who we did the jail to prison series on, first time offender, arrested and convicted of murder, and she's doing life in prison in California, says that at least at the women's prison, they love following true crime. Charlie actually said that an inmate who had been in for years saw him and asked if he was an Adelson. And Charlie was like, yeah, how do you know? He said, I know all about this case. So people know who he is. This is a huge case in Florida. It's going to be interesting and a very different world in prison than it is in jail. It is a completely different society within a society. It could be a bit of an adjustment for Charlie. So this place is about an hour and a half from Tallahassee. It looks like he's in protective custody, which would be solitary. So according to the Florida Department of Corrections handbook, there's a section about assessments. This is where Charlie is, and this is what he'll be undergoing while he's at this transfer facility. Upon arriving, he would have had a brief medical exam, transfer money from the jail into the prison system that he had on his books, by the way, in one of the calls, Charlie said that he was so sure he would be found not guilty. He gave away all of his commissary food and his socks. So after he was found guilty, what does he do? Like, Ma, I need some money on my books. I gave everything away. Thought he was going to be taking a ride down south, but no dice. He'll also have a shower and an issue of state clothing. He would have had his electronic fingerprints taken, an orientation on day-to-day -day living in the facility as well as in prison, and just general information about his forever home, wherever that may land him in the Florida Department of Corrections. While he's at this transfer facility, he'll have a physical a psychological, a spectrum, an educational, and substance abuse screening. What is a spectrum screening? It digs into the inmate's relationships and the dynamics and his thoughts and feelings, which help develop a program just for Charlie. They'll interview him about his background, his education, his employment history. In restricted housing in the Florida DOC, you get at least three showers a week. In prison, the canteen is open daily and there is a weekly purchase limit. So let's look at the canteen because I actually have a copy of what's available in the Florida DOC. You can get your ramen. You can buy flip-flops for $3.35. You can get nail clippers for $2.29. Crayola drawing chalk in case you and your buddies want to do some sidewalk chalk. Those will set you back $2.00 and 82 cents colored pencils a 24 pack that's going to cost you 11 dollars and 82 cents sketch pads seven dollars and 21 cents as far as drinks you can get instant coffee chocolate milk coke diet coke fanta sprite those are all around a dollar 25 for an eight ounce can candy you can get butterfingers gummy bears lemon drops m and peanuts Snickers, Starlight Mints. For toiletries, you can get body lotion for $2.67. You can get deodorant, shampoo, things like that. Anywhere between one and three dollars. Toilet paper, toothpaste, washcloths, condiments. You can get barbecue sauce, ketchup, mayonnaise, mustard, plastic spoon. I have a jail to prison series. One of those episodes focuses on how creative inmates get with making jailhouse food out of commissary stuff. You can get chips. The whole shebang is something that anybody who's ever been in prison raves about. I'm going to order some off Amazon and try them out. I've heard they're really, really good. Bagel chips. You can get beef and cheese. This isn't really as expensive as I've seen it in other states. But you can get crackers, you can get freezer pops, pepperoni calzones, sausage biscuits, health age, you can get athlete's foot cream, you can get multivitamins, you can get pain reliever, which is Tylenol, vitamins, you can buy batteries, playing cards, envelopes, you can get oatmeal, all kinds of little things like pork skins, pop tarts, those are a dollar and something. Entrees, you can get ready-made meals you toss in the microwave. Cool Ranch Doritos. You can get a combination lock for $8.52. You can get pastries like cherry pie, probably those little ones that come in the packets. You can get a pocket dictionary. Sunglasses, $3.75. You can get a shaver for $13.07. Racquetball, get a poncho. Plastic mirror. Photo album, no metal, 20 page, $3.09. Notebook paper, 150 pieces, cost you $2.46. So you do see there are things that he can get 
It's not like being home, though. Come on. People are always curious about the commissaries. In the Florida DOC, the canteen is open in prisons daily. According to this, that's always subject to staffing and things like that. There is a weekly purchase limit of how much you can buy. They don't specify what that is. Speaking of handbooks, I found the one for Leon County Jail. That's where Charlie just left from, and that's where Donna currently is. So here's a few rules about her home until trial. As far as commissary, I'm not sure with her being in direct observation whether or not she gets commissary or may, she may be limited in what she can get. In general population at Leon County, here are the rules for commissary. You have a weekly spending limit of $80. At any point when an inmate maintains balance in their account, subsequent charges for booking fees, medical fees, inmate meal fees, canteen charges, or other fees will be deducted from the inmate account at the full amount owed to the facility. When you have your mugshot and fingerprint taken, just for reference, you're charged a $6 fee. If you have that in your inmate account, that's coming out. When she's off self-harm watch, she will be issued clothing. Right now, she is in the self-harm vest or dress or whatever you want to call it. That was part of the accusation that was heard in court where she said she was forced to be naked all day. It's not like she's laying there buck naked. These things, you don't wear undergarments because they don't want you to have access to anything that you could use to hurt yourself. Clothing is exchanged twice a week. Two pair of underwear is all they give you. You can purchase more in the commissary if you have money. Inmates are given toilet paper, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrush, soap, and a comb. Deodorant is only issued on the first Thursday of each month. Books are distributed to each pod twice a month. What can Donna have in her cell once she's out of solitary? One pair of approved tennis shoes, which come through the commissary, and one pair of gel-issued footwear. She'll have her gel-issued clothing, personal hygiene given by the gel, as well as anything she purchases from the commissary. Two sheets, one pillow, one pillowcase, one mattress, which... You hear Charlie on one call saying he rolled his mattress up. Not a Tempur-Pedic, not a sleep number for sure. One blanket as necessary, one towel, one washcloth. Clothing through the commissary, you are allowed a maximum of seven t-shirts, seven pairs of socks, two sets of long underwear, five approved library books. She can have legal papers, writing materials that are either issued or bought at commissary. Each time you leave the pod living area and return, you will be searched. Each pod has a common TV, and the officer controls the television selections and the volume. The custody level for Donna will likely be maximum due to her charges, and close custody is also for higher-level charges. It considers the level of charges and makes sure that that inmate is protected. Once out of solitary, she can also have five four by six photos. Anybody sending her photos cannot put an address label or a lickable stamp on there. People have been known to put some drugs laced on there. The inmate gets it, takes a lick, and enjoys a little journey while in the pokey. Meal times for Donna. Breakfast, bright and early, 4.30 a.m. Lunch is at 10.30 a.m., Supper is at 5.30 p.m. The jail will deduct $2.70 every day from an inmate account with a balance to cover food. If Donna were to need to see a nurse, there's a $10 charge. What costs $6 per visit? Seeing a doctor or a psychiatrist, a dentist, getting medications, x-rays, and any diagnostic tests. Inmate head counts occur at minimum between 4.30 to 5.30 a.m., 4.30 to 5.30 p.m., and 11.30 to 12.30 a.m. What are some of the rules? All correctional officers are to be addressed as officer, Mr., Mrs., or the title of their position along with their last name. Keep your rooms clean. Assist in cleaning the day room area as well as the recreation room. Beds are to be made when you're not asleep, and they actually have a diagram of how that bed should be made. It's like military, bounce a quarter. No lending, bartering, or exchanging of anything to other inmates. Inmates are encouraged to shower daily, but required only twice a week. Whew. You cannot go into other people's cells, and you cannot alter your clothing. You cannot leave any assigned area without the permission of your supervisor. Discipline, a minor infractions, you're just going to get a little talking to, maybe a two-hour lockdown. And then a major, you can have sanctions imposed on you for up to 30 days. And when a rule violation like that has happened, they will take a disciplinary report and forward that to an investigating officer. 
Once the investigation into the incident is complete, the inmate can have 24 hours to prepare a defense or they can waive it. A hearing is held within seven days. With the level of observation that Donna's under, it's called direct observation, 24 hour visuals. You have cameras on you and guards are checking on you constantly. Y'all, my bladder would burst. I cannot go tinkle in front of cameras. I don't know how these inmates do it. I guess maybe you get used to it, but... Mm -mm. So there's also a website called countyjail.net. It's kind of like Yelp for jails. People that have been in give their opinion and kind of rate the jails on how it is on the inside. Well, I found one for Leon County Jail. They post about their experiences, about the food and things like that. So Leon County Jail. What do they say about the foods? Three meals a day, lunch is always a sandwich, no seasoning on any of this food, and they say the portions are small. If they were to rate it on a scale of one to 10, one inmate gave it a two, the other gave it a one, only because the juice you get with breakfast is really good. The kitchen crew dubs one meal cat meat. It's ground meat that nobody's been able to identify. They also call mac and cheese mac and erasers. The rice is hard, it's nasty, there's no seasoning. One inmate said that court appearances make for a very, very long day. The process starts between 5 and 6 a.m. And it's not like Uber where they run you to the courtroom and then they run you back to the jail. You have to wait for everybody in your block to have their court appearances, which sometimes can have you leaving as late as 7 p.m. For TV, the inmates say they would vote on what they would watch. One inmate said, ask for clean slippers. It's easy to get some kind of a foot fungus with used slippers. At least you can get that athlete's foot stuff in the commissary. So let's jump to these Adelson calls. This one that I'm talking about here, this happened on November 6th, just last month, the day Charlie was found guilty. It was a shock to all of them, no doubt. Who all does he contact the most? Obviously, Donna being number one. His dad's on some of the calls, typically is in the background. He talks to Bree, who is the mother of his child, and also to Janice, who is his girlfriend or I don't know. It's hard to figure out what's what. On the day of his conviction, November 6, 2023, he calls. Donna is crying and asks Charlie if he's still in direct observation. He says he is. Ironically, the same unit Donna is on right now, as far as we know. She asked if Charlie slept the night before. He said they keep the lights on. They're bright. They're fluorescent. But he said he can put his head under the covers and go to sleep. Donna is crying and said they need to talk when they have a moment about things they need to take care of. Charlie says, yeah, about money and stuff. And Donna says, also, your son. There are calls with Charlie's son on there. I'm not putting those out. These boys, they're victims. They're going to have to bear the load of these terrible choices made by the adults in this situation for the rest of their lives. But I will say, to be fair, we talked last week about how the mother of his child had to take Charlie to court for insurance and child support. I will say that in the phone calls with his son, you can tell this little dude loves his dad a lot. And it seems reciprocal. It seems like that relationship definitely improved over time. Charlie is responsible for a loving father being taken away from his boys. And some of the times that Charlie actually gets emotional and cries is anytime his son is mentioned. I don't feel sorry for Charlie feel really sorry for this kid. It's, it's very clear he loves his daddy. Donna says, we need to take care of your son. Charlie starts to cry and he says, it's like I'm dead. He said, I hate to tell you, but this really isn't a whole lot different. Donna and Harvey are crying too. Harvey says, maybe something will happen and this mistrial will take place. Let's just hope for that. Charlie says, yeah, we need to talk about my son, the dog, the house, everything. Donna is still sobbing. She says, and you, it's not over. Harvey says they will try everything. Charlie's attorney was supposed to stop by before he drove back home. And Charlie says he doesn't want to say anything to his son right now about what's going on because he's at a point where his son asked to see him when they talk. He just wanted to see his kid grow up. Well, he should have thought of that. So did Dan Markell. He wanted to see his boys grow up too. They're all three sobbing. And Donna says, I still think there's hope. There could be a chance and we're going to work on it. Charlie tells Donna and Harvey he doesn't want them to get themselves sick because they're all he has. Donna says they're fine as long as they can talk to him. Not anymore. I wonder how that's going, by the way. You think about it. Donna's been in jail over a month now. And as frequently as they called and as long as they talked, their codependency on each other which a lot of it was Charlie complaining over and over about the same things and Donna just validating him and poor baby. You have to wonder emotionally how they're holding up with not talking and now you have Charlie moved. So that's a big event. And maybe he's talking to Harvey, but 
I don't know. Hopefully Harvey knows how to put money on his books. Seems like Wendy, by the way, totally distancing herself from her family. And we'll get to that. I'm going to play a small clip in a minute of this call because the audio is good. Charlie says he does not want to talk over the phone about the case. That's a promise none of them kept, by the way. Charlie said if he stays too upset, they're going to keep him on direct observation. Donna also tells him that in a call where she says they were told they will watch him and see if he's crying, if he's emotional. That could extend this stay. Charlie really wanted to get back to his cell where he had a window and things like that. He said direct observation is a concrete box. Donna says to call back in 15 or 20 minutes while she talks to his attorney, Dan. The next call was, uh, again, the day Charlie was found guilty with the mother of his child. She's crying and saying she did not expect the guilty verdict. Charlie says he still can't believe it, and he thought they had a shot. He thought he was coming home. She cries and says Charlie just didn't deserve this. He says, I know. I love you and our son more than anything. He says he'll be there for him and her in any way possible he can support them. He says when he gets to prison, he'll be talking on a phone and looking at her through glass. She said she would be there the first day if he wants to see her. He wants to visit with his son and he wants to promise her that their son will always be taken care of. Charlie says that this has torn his heart out. He tells her they put him in direct observation. He said, I'm not going to hurt myself, but he did complain there's blood and feces spread all over the walls. He said he knew it was a shame when he came to Tallahassee that he was public enemy number one with all the press the case has gotten. He said prosecutor Kappelman dumbed down the closings to a third grade level and Charlie thought it was a joke. He always refers to it as a Dateline special. He asked her to keep an eye on his parents. She said she has reached out to Donna, but Donna hasn't responded, but she said that's understandable. There's another call with Donna on the day of his conviction. This, by far, seems to be the call that sealed the deal as far as her getting arrested. Charlie talks to Donna about his appeal chances, and he said that his attorney told him, for example, maybe a few months down the road, a juror writes something stupid on a blog and there's an investigation. But on future phone calls, Charlie really seems to have a good grasp on the fact that the chances of appeal are slim to none because, according to Charlie, such a high-profile case, they were very careful, the judge was careful in the rulings and all that stuff. Donna says that they have a lot to do on a very tight time frame. One of the things involves making sure that Charlie's son is taken care of. She says that Harvey has been on the phone all day and a friend named Susan is helping and in fact came to her house just 10 minutes before this call from Charlie. Donna says when she does have something to tell him, she will talk through his attorney. At this point, the call drops and Donna doesn't hit end. So when you call somebody who's an inmate, the minute that phone connects, even when you're listening to that automated thing you hear before every single call, you can hear if there's any movement on each line. Well, also, both people have to hang up in order for these calls to stop being recorded. And when she didn't, there was a lot of information that came out. I bet the prosecution was like rubbing their hands, like keep going, keep going. By the way, there are over 500 calls on this log. I have, I think, 68, 69 recordings. So a lot we didn't hear. There was a lot of calls, a lot of long calls. The day Donna was arrested, I think she was arrested more in the evening. From then on, lots of calls. We got a hot mic here. We're fly on the wall. Donna's telling her friends and Harvey that Charlie told the mental health people he's not going to hurt himself, but being in there makes him want to. He just wants to go back to his cell. Donna then says, I think it would be a nice way to just leave me alone. Goodbye. Then you can't understand what she says, but it says something about can't go to prison. I can't push it. I'm not that strong. Also, I know how he, meaning Charlie, in a year and a half, his body and everything just slowly started to deteriorate. She says, I'm old. I have a life. We had a great marriage. Happy. We traveled. We lived good. And I wasn't willing to just say goodbye. Nothing painful. I just want to go to sleep. We bought our cemetery property a couple of months ago. We're good. I'm good. She references mentioning something to Wendy. And she said, Wendy came over the other night. She sat on the couch right there. I was sitting here and she didn't say, look, mom, this is a horrible time for all of us. Charlie's on trial for his life. We're all aggravated. But if this is what you're thinking, I'm going to Baker Act you. Well, what's Baker Act is an involuntary 72-hour mental health hold. Donna said she told Wendy she was not feeling that way and she's fine. 
Donna says she asked Wendy if she could have seen the boys the next night, and Wendy says yes. Donna tells her friends and Harvey, am I suicidal? No. Do I want to go to sleep? I do. Perfectly honest. Harvey says something in the background, and Donna says, do it together. Leave a note. They'll know when to come and get us, and we'll do it together. Make a decision at some point. Get this. After speaking to Charlie's attorney this morning and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't because Dan said, Dan being Charlie's attorney, you might or you might do all of this and get to the airport and they'll stop us and that could happen. I don't know, but it's worth a try. I've tried and tried and I don't know what I'm doing. I've lost it, but I don't know what I'm doing. We have to work out stuff for Charlie's son. In the background, it's kind of muffled, but you hear them talk about a trustee and a guardian. I think Wendy was second or third on that list. Donna says, if my daughter would make some effort to respond, I could sit here with you and say, would you do this? She says she doesn't know how to get in touch with Wendy. Isn't that interesting? So Donna asked Wendy's boyfriend, whose name is George. She says, Wendy told me to go through her lawyer if it's about the case. I said, it's not about the case. So I'm going to play this little clip now. It's very clear. You should be able to follow along with this audio. This is the day Charlie was found guilty. Clearly, Charlie's attorney has told them you're probably next and soon as far as being arrested. So here is that call. It's Charlie, he's worried about you. We know you never ask anything about your brother, and she doesn't, and she told me. And I said... I just got off with Charlie. He's worried about you. We know you never ask anything about your brother, and she doesn't. And she told me it's because her lawyer said she shouldn't ask. We found out. And I said, I just got off with Charlie. He's worried about you. We know you never ask anything about your brother, and she doesn't. And she told me it's because her lawyer said she shouldn't ask. We found out it's not true. But we just got off the phone with him. So I wrote this last night. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is 8 o'clock last night. But we just got off the phone with him. And the first thing he asked was, How's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called up or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up the phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. But then she didn't answer. But then I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us, is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong, and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. Say she was. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my I do know my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true. We've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. Not about the case, is it? Not what I said about her brother and that he wants. How are you, Wendy? How's my sister holding up? Mm -hmm. If you have anything further to say about the case, please go through our lawyers. Right now, I have to be singularly focused on taking care of the boys during this difficult time. So I wrote back, okay. We have no desire to speak with you about the case. I guess Dad and I are just shocked that you didn't think of coming to see us or even calling us. We are your parents. We are and have always been there for you and the boys. None of what we wrote matters about the case. That's over. I just want you to know how many times Charlie is asking about you. Not only do you not ask about us, but not one question about Charlie, right? We will need to give you some information shortly, and we need some business assistance. Please let us know if you can be of any help. I have a space here. I want to give her codes. We're going to be gone. I want her to have all this information. I have the, I have the cemetery property. I want her to see all that. I want her to have all these papers and the wills. I want her to see all this. So please let us know if you can be of any help. The other thing is the visa, which she would know about the visa. No, I said we need, 
we need some business assistance. Please let us know. If, if not, we'll try to find someone who can help us. This needs an immediate reply so I can start asking other people to help. And then she always gets nervous if we want to talk to her. So I wrote, don't get nervous. Again, nothing, in capital letters, nothing about the case. Just would like to show you some business stuff and personal things. If you can't do it, we must find someone who can. I hope you understand that it has nothing to do with the case. There is no more case. So that you're revealing. I mean, you see that Donna clearly is just super frustrated with Wendy and seems like Wendy's just putting herself out of the equation as much as she can. You never hear a phone call with Wendy, by the way, on any of these jail calls. Donna says that Wendy told them that if they wanted to talk about the case to go through their attorney, she says they found out that wasn't true. It's not the best audio, but what comes after is Donna saying that she asked Wendy's boyfriend, George, if Wendy had told the boys about Charlie being found guilty, and he said that she did. Donna says that Ben and Charlie were very close, and apparently he had been writing to him while he was in jail, if I heard that correctly. She also asked how they were handling it. George said that Ben was being very quiet and didn't really talk much about it. And then Lincoln kind of faced it and just said, so he's never coming back. And then in 10 minutes, he was kind of doing his own thing, which Donna said is okay. He's a child. She doesn't want to see them miserable and upset. She said, that's not my goal. I just want to know how they are. She also mentions about having to get some photos downloaded. She goes on to say that Wendy could help them with this. She said they are looking things up over and over because things change. And she's talking about extradition. She said to see if there's extradition from Vietnam because we've looked at all the places that they could go. They looked at China or Korea. Does she not realize that if she flees to a country that's not extradition, it's not, they're just probably going to hand her over and be like, there you go. There's your girl. It's hard to hear, but I think maybe Harvey says that Wendy is coming over in about 15 minutes and Donna just very abruptly says, good. Maybe she can look it up beforehand and keep us from wasting time. Her friend asks if Wendy would tell maybe about where they're going to flee to. Harvey says no. It's hard to tell here. It sounds like maybe she's reading a text again. But Donna says, if you tell Wendy beforehand, I need to tell you something as an attorney who doesn't talk and has nothing to do with the case. It just has to do with mom and I and some decisions that we have to make. Harvey says something and Donna says, yeah, I know you want to bring her up and show her where everything is. It's a plane crash. No one is going to know where anything is or who belongs to what. So I would like for her to come up here so she could see it. I don't think that's asking too much. Some people are hearing she lives three hours away. Some are hearing she doesn't live three hours away. I heard she doesn't live three hours away. In other words, it's not like we're asking you to drive a long distance to come help us with this stuff. Every time she says, can you do this? Can you come here? Can you everything? How many times do we have plans we have to cancel? Wendy needed us for this. Wendy needs us to babysit. So we've been really good nannies. And I guess our job is up because now the boys are older. They can go out with friends. They can do things on their own. So she doesn't need grandma or grandpa. At this point, she's crying because you know how obsessed she was with these grandkids. And they are at an age where they don't need babysitting all the time. And she says, okay, pretty hurtful. I have one son I don't speak with, one son who's close to being dead, and my daughter, whom I love, is doing this. I don't get it. I said to Harvey, I swear to God, our family's cursed, absolutely cursed, and I don't know how to take care of it anymore. And there's a pearl clutching and crying going on. And she says something about a hotel, and they need an address to put it on the visa. That ended that call, and we're going to end there for today. I think tomorrow or possibly Thursday, I'm going to do an update episode on some other cases we've been covering. It's kind of quiet. This time of year, things sort of slow down until the new year, but... Ruby Frankie pled guilty, and there's some other developments in other cases. Nothing major, but some things to catch up on just so we're staying current. In the meantime, I appreciate all y'all, and we will see you soon. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.